Thanks for joining us for today's Medicare 101 presentation. I'm Joanne Giardini-Russell here with Cameron Giardini, and it's probably no surprise that we're with Giardini Medicare. We're based in Michigan, working virtually to help our clients with their transition to the Medicare system. What transitioning to Medicare means to us is that you're enrolling into the Medicare system at age 65 when you're first eligible or you're starting Medicare after age 65 due to your retirement, for example. You're trying to figure out how to get your coverage lined up without making major mistakes. Of course, one of the biggest hurdles to overcome in this process is understanding the basics of the Medicare system. So during this video, we'll provide an overview to help you understand how Medicare works so that you can ultimately choose the best coverage to meet your individual needs. If you're turning 65, you probably know what this slide means. This is probably what you're seeing every day in your mailbox, not to mention the endless stream of robocalls that you're receiving. If you look here, these mailers are designed to look official and have you feel that this is the only way that you can get help with your Medicare options. We're here to help cut through this confusion and noise and to help you find out which plan is best for you without interrupting your dinner every night with a phone call like you're probably used to. We also point out that even well-known publications can lead to even more Medicare confusion. This piece was brought to my attention last year. Being a piece that is published by Costco, we know that millions of people are reading this. When I read it, I noticed that number one, it was written by a doctor. Well, he's an MD, so he's got to be correct, right? Well, see the two arrows here. The arrows represent information that is close to being correct, but if you just took this information at its face value, you'd likely be making the wrong decision when it comes to your Medicare options. The reason we bring these things up is that when it comes to your transition to Medicare, details do matter. We are an independent source of information regarding the changes you are going to face in order to avoid the many pitfalls that exist in this system. That being said, let's get started. During this session, you're going to learn the ins and the outs of Medicare. That means, what is Medicare? Do I need it? How much does it cost? How do I enroll? What will it cover? What do my health care choices look like? How do you put the pieces all together? And one of our goals is to get you through this process in a rather stress-free manner so that you can go relax and get on to more important things such as your retirement. First, what is Medicare? We always tell people if you think of Medicare as just another form of health insurance, it can make the whole process easier to understand. Yes, it is going to be different than what you're used to with employer coverage or even individual coverage, but at the end of the day, it's simply health insurance coverage that is administered by the federal government. Whenever anyone refers to original Medicare, they are only talking about Medicare Part A and Part B. We'll cover Parts A and Part B shortly, but understand here that original Medicare is not free, nor is it designed to cover 100% of your health care costs. Additionally, being a federal program, it is designed to primarily work inside the United States. Let's talk about who is eligible for Medicare. Typically, your Medicare eligibility will begin on the first day of the month that you turn 65 years old. However, if you are eligible for Social Security Disability, are diagnosed with ALS or ESRD, which is end-stage renal disease, you may be eligible for Medicare prior to turning 65 years old. Part A. Let's talk through what this coverage provides and what it costs. Most people will pay no premium for Part A coverage as long as you have satisfied the 40-quarter requirements related to Social Security and Medicare payroll taxes. As long as you have satisfied that requirement, you have essentially pre-funded your Part A premium, meaning you'll pay nothing for Part A. Note also that if you have not satisfied this requirement, you may also be eligible for premium-free Part A through a spouse's record. The majority of people do not pay additional Part A premiums. What does Part A actually cover? We typically refer to this as room and board coverage. It'll help cover hospitalization, skilled nursing facility stays, hospice care, and some home health services. Note that there are deductibles and coinsurance requirements if you are hospitalized or are inpatient with another facility. However, remember that the deductibles and coinsurance are only going to apply if you have only original Medicare for your coverage. As you'll see shortly, most people will be choosing additional products that will alleviate these costs. One thing that we always want to point out is that Medicare will not be a provider of long-term care coverage. Many people tend to confuse the term skilled nursing with nursing home coverage, and they believe that Medicare will cover these items. Know that they will not, and you should work with your financial professional to discuss your long-term care strategy, as many people do require this coverage as they age. 
Unlike Medicare Part A, Part B does come with a monthly premium that we'll highlight shortly. Medicare Part B is designed for outpatient medical procedures such as doctor visits, durable medical equipment, outpatient surgeries, and more. During 2020, the annual Part B deductible is $198 for the calendar year. After you have met this deductible, you are responsible for 20% of the medical costs that original Medicare does not cover. It's important to note that there is no cap or max out of pocket to what that 20% could be in any calendar year. Let's talk about some items that original Medicare will not cover. We won't get into everything, and we just mentioned long-term care coverage, but many people are surprised to learn that Original Medicare will not cover routine dental, vision, and hearing items. They will also not cover gym memberships, nor will they cover prescription medications. And remember, when we're talking about Original Medicare, we are referring to only parts A and B. Let's jump right into a very common Medicare myth. Take 10 seconds to answer this question. Is it mandatory to enroll into Medicare Part A at age 65? Contrary to what your friends, family, and TV tell you, the answer is actually no. This answer of no is only for those of you that are not receiving Social Security benefits at age 65. If you are drawing benefits, Medicare Part A will be mandatory, but for the rest of you, surprisingly, it is not. Confusing, right? The point of that exercise is to show you how confusing the transition to Medicare can be. Many of you believe that you need to enroll into Medicare at age 65 when you get notices like this from the Social Security Administration. In the highlighted area, it says, quote, even if you don't plan to receive monthly benefits, be sure to sign up for Medicare three months before turning age 65. Well, the words following that statement are technically correct, but it can be extremely misleading to the consumer. For example, if you or your spouse are turning 65 and are actively working for a large employer with over 20 employees and plan to continue working past age 65, you do not technically need to enroll into Medicare Part B when you're first eligible. As long as your employer coverage is credible, you will not be penalized later. But the notice from the Social Security states, quote, if you don't sign up when you're first eligible, your coverage may be delayed and you may pay a late enrollment penalty, end quote. You can see why it's difficult to know what to do. These documents are very generalized, but people read into specific words and they can often make mistakes. We can help walk you through your individual situation. Like we've already alluded to, be careful where you seek advice. Your friends, although they have the best intentions, are often as confused as you are. The Social Security Administration is not always a reliable source for Medicare information. Social Security's role in this process is to facilitate enrollments and collect premiums for Medicare. That's it. Your doctor has enough on their hands when it comes to medical care. They don't have the time to be insurance experts. And your outside advisors may also have limited knowledge when it comes to the Medicare system and your choices. We believe in specialization. Just as we do not specialize in taxation or financial planning, they do not specialize in Medicare. You've reached the point in life when you're now eligible for Medicare. So you've called us and I'm going to talk you through a typical starter conversation. We'll first ask you about your current situation. We'll ask questions like, are you actively employed? Are you working for an employer? with less than 20 people? Are you possibly eligible for any retiree coverage? Are you currently enrolled in the ACA or marketplace coverage? Do you plan on using COBRA past age 65? All of these situations can uniquely impact what you should or should not do related to your Medicare coverage. Now let's assume that you've gone through this analysis and the outcome is, I need Medicare. One of the first questions you'll have for us is, how much will Part B cost me? You may be surprised to learn that Medicare Part B premiums are directly correlated to your income. Your Part B premium is based on your modified adjusted gross income from your tax return two years prior to your enrollment into Part B. Most new Medicare enrollees will find that their premium for 2020 will be $144.60 per month. Note that this is per person per month. Everything when it comes to Medicare is on an individual basis. If you are one of the people that are affected by these higher income surcharges shown here, it may be possible to request a redetermination to lower these premiums. Please check out our other videos or give us a call if this may apply to you. 
Not only does your income impact what you may pay for Medicare Part B, but those same income thresholds will impact what you'll pay each month for Part D prescription drug coverage. So we've determined that, yes, you need Medicare. You know what your particular cost will be for original Medicare. Now let's talk about how you actually enroll into Medicare's Part A and Part B. Medicare Part A, there are a couple of special considerations that we're going to discuss here. One, if you're currently receiving Social Security benefits prior to your turning age 65, realize that you will be automatically enrolled into both Part A and Part B. We're only focusing on Part A here, so just note that if you're collecting your benefits, you must remain enrolled into Part A. We need to point out a second scenario which relates to Part A, health savings account contributions. If you are enrolled into any part of Medicare, you are no longer eligible to contribute to an HSA. So you'll want to delay your enrollment into Part A or stop your HSA contributions. If you are not contributing to a health savings account, you will likely want to enroll in Part A when you're first eligible at age 65, even if you plan to continue working. Here's a good graphic showing when you should apply for Medicare Part A when you're first eligible. This can be done during your initial enrollment period. Many of you know this time period. You'll call us and say, I think I have to do something three months before my birthday. You're close. This is the time period consisting of the three months prior to your 65th birth month, the month of your birthday, and the three months following your birth month. It's specifically your own initial enrollment period. If you are not drawing Social Security benefits and do want to enroll into Part A coverage, we recommend going online to ssa.gov during the three months prior before your birthday month to enroll. Now let's focus on when and how to enroll into Part B, which is the trickier of the two. There are two general scenarios when it comes to enrolling into Part B. The first scenario is you are applying for Medicare Part B at age 65 when you're first eligible. There are two different situations that can occur here. You are either already claiming your Social Security benefits as you turn 65 or you are not. First, let's look at what you need to do to enroll into Medicare if you are drawing Social Security benefits. You may remember that you will be automatically enrolled into both Part A and Part B if you are collecting Social Security income benefits. If this is the case, you should expect your red, white, and blue Medicare card to arrive one to three months before your 65th birth month. If you want to be enrolled into Part B, you need to do nothing further. You will be enrolled into both parts. Now, let's say you don't want to be enrolled into Part B, but you are drawing Social Security benefits. Here is an example. Mrs. Smith is turning 65 and elected to receive her Social Security income payments at age 63. Mr. Smith is 63 years old and he is still actively working. She is currently covered by his employer insurance plan. Then her Medicare card arrives and she files it away, not realizing that she has enrolled into Part B, which she does not need. Remember, she has her health insurance through her husband's employer. Now, the payments for Part B are still being automatically deducted each month from her Social Security benefits, and this can easily go unnoticed. Therefore, if you are drawing Social Security benefits and you do not want Part B medical coverage, you'll need to follow the instructions that come with the Medicare Welcome Packet and your red, white, and blue Medicare card. Here's an example of the instructions that you'll receive. You'll need to follow these instructions all the way through, and then once you do so, you will receive a new Medicare card indicating that you only have Part A hospital coverage. Now let's shift back to if you are not drawing Social Security benefits and you do want to enroll into Part B at age 65. You will need to be proactive and actually apply for this coverage. I can't stress this enough, this will not happen automatically. The best way to do this is to go online and enroll through ssa.gov. You can see here on the main page of their website, you'll go to the Medicare Enrollment section, and this is where you can apply for Medicare Part A and Part B. Another way to enroll is to call Social Security directly at 1-800-772-1213. Or you can go in person to your local Social Security office. 
If you decide that you're turning 65 and you do want to start Medicare Part A and B, you will want to enroll during your initial enrollment period, more specifically during the three months before you turn age 65 so that your coverage will begin the first day of the month that you turn 65. Now let's look at the second scenario related to applying for Part B. This is when you deferred Part B when you were first eligible at age 65 because you had employer coverage. Now you are retiring past age 65 and you need your Part B coverage to begin. This does require a different process than applying for Part B at age 65. You will need to show proof of creditable insurance coverage through an employer so that you will not receive a late enrollment penalty. There are two forms that you'll need in order to complete the Part B enrollment process at this point. One is a form CMS L564 and the other is form CMS 40B. On this screen, you'll see an example showing form L564, which is a request for employment information. You'll have to get this form filled out by your employer's benefit department or whoever handles the insurance benefits at your employer. Form 40B, on the other hand, is your application for Part B coverage that you will also fill out. Your employer does not have to fill out anything when it comes to Form 40B. Now this is very important, but on this form, be sure to note in the remarks section, which is section 12, the month you want your Part B to start. And you can see this as an example. You wanna specify exactly when you want your Part B to begin. Note that if you did not enroll into Medicare Part A when you were first eligible, you only need the employer verification form and not the application for Part B, which was the Form 40B. We recommend that you complete each form, make copies for your records, and bring them in person to your local Social Security office. Something important to do while at the office is ask them to process these forms while you wait. It takes them only a few minutes to complete, and we've had cases where forms are dropped off and never processed after leaving. It is also possible to send these forms via mail to the Social Security office, but we really don't recommend this method. If you do choose this, though, you will want to send them to your local Social Security office. I know what you may be thinking, but no, you cannot apply for Medicare Part B only online. This is a good visual showing what Cameron just discussed. You want to make sure that you bring the required forms to the Social Security office one to three months before the date you want your Medicare coverage to begin. Remember that you'll be coordinating this with your employer coverage ending, so be sure to file these papers ahead of time. And note, again, on that Form 40B, which month you need your Part B coverage to begin. We won't go into a lot of detail here. Just realize that there can be some tricky timing issues if you are retiring and leaving your employer coverage right around your 65th birth month. This would be a whole other video to discuss, so just call us for guidance if this is you. Okay, so now we've talked about how and when to sign up for Original Medicare Parts A and Part B. Let's talk about what comes next. Once you have Medicare Part A and B in place, you'll want to decide which additional coverage path is the one for you to take. Here is the starting point. You can see here from the official Medicare and You handbook that there are two main choices when it comes to rounding out your Medicare benefits. The first option, as you can see on the left, is that you retain original Medicare as your primary insurance, and then you add to that supplemental coverage in the form of Medigap insurance, along with a standalone Part D prescription drug plan. On the right is your second option. You may choose to enroll into an all-in-one alternative to Original Medicare, which is known as Medicare Advantage and also sometimes referred to as Part C. Let's take a closer look at what these two options look like. We do wanna point out here that we have several other detailed videos about Medigap and Medicare Advantage comparing the two options on our YouTube channel. What follows here will be more of an overview. So if you want a more detailed discussion, make sure you check those out. This is an example of how original Medicare works with a Medigap insurance plan plus a Part D prescription drug plan. For medical coverage, original Medicare will remain your primary insurance. Then your Medigap plan, will become your secondary coverage designed to pay the out-of-pocket costs that we discussed in the beginning left behind by our original Medicare. And you'll also need to add prescription drug coverage, also known as Part D, if this is the route you decide to take. Because original Medicare remains your primary insurance, you may seek care at any physician's office or facility that accepts original Medicare. Now we'll look at Medicare Advantage. Remember that this is also commonly referred to as Part C of Medicare. 
However, we refer to this as Medicare Advantage. But know that this is the all-in-one alternative to original Medicare. With Medicare Advantage, the federal government funds private insurance companies to administer your Medicare benefits. When this happens, you can see here that Part A, Part B, and your prescription drug coverage are built into one package. Because the Medicare Advantage plan is now your primary insurance, you must agree to seek care at doctors, facilities, and hospitals that are contracted with your specific Medicare Advantage plan. This chart helps bring things to life for many people. Using the 48167 Michigan zip code, we will compare the two choices that you have when it comes to your Medicare coverage. You can choose either a Medigap plan, which is shown in the middle column, or you can choose a Medicare Advantage plan shown on the right. We'll show you a popular plan available in this zip code. Let's start with the monthly premiums, which is the fixed amount that you'll pay to have your coverage in place. Note here that this monthly premium will be added to your Part B premiums each month. So to be clear, regardless of which path you choose here, you will still pay the monthly premium to the government for Part B coverage. The monthly premium for Medigap in this case is $115 per month whereas the Medicare Advantage plan comes with no additional premium, as you can see at the top. In our example, we are looking at a Medigap Plan G. So with a Medigap Plan G, when a person pays their $115 per month to the insurance carrier, the carrier agrees to pay all Medicare-approved costs that Medicare does not cover. This Plan G comes with a $198 annual deductible. Once you have met that deductible, you will be fully covered for Medicare-approved medical procedures for the year, hence the many zeros you can see for the out-of-pocket costs. Now let's take a look over at the Medicare Advantage example. The lower monthly premium with the Medicare Advantage will come with higher out-of-pocket costs when you do seek care. I won't review all of these in detail, but take a minute to look at some common procedures and the copays related to them with these particular plans. Again, this is just one plan out of thousands of Medicare Advantage plans available in the United States. Be sure to look at the plans available to you in your area. Plans can even vary from county to county or zip code to zip code. Lastly, you'll notice that routine dental and vision care is included in many Medicare Advantage plans, which is one of the many features that differentiates them from Medigap policies. Now, what many people begin thinking about when they're running through that last example is, you know, I'm pretty healthy. I take one minor cholesterol medication. I like the idea of having some dental in the plan, so I'm going to go with the Medicare Advantage plan for a few years, and I'm going to see how it goes. Well, that might work out or it might not work out. Let's talk about why your health, not only now but in the future, is really important to discuss and think this through. You can see here in the official CMS handbook called Choosing a Medigap Policy, it is noted that the best time to buy a Medigap policy is during your Medigap open enrollment period. What this means is that you have a period of six months that begins the first day of the month that you are both age 65 or older and have started your Part B coverage. What this means in reality, it means that you can purchase any Medigap policy regardless of any pre-existing conditions during this time. So if you didn't know this piece of information, and you had enrolled into a Medicare Advantage plan, and then four years later, for example, you developed certain pre-existing conditions, and now you wanted to secure a Medigap policy, you may be declined for that coverage. This is why it's important to understand your Medigap enrollment period, regardless of your current health. Here's a graphic that shows the Medigap open enrollment. Again, notice that you must be over age 65 and have your Part B newly activated. This enrollment time is not to be confused with the annual election period that occurs from October 15th until December 7th and is often mistakenly referred to as open enrollment. Medigap open enrollment is specific to you, the individual, and it does not occur again once it has passed. And back to the article we showed earlier from Costco's publication, and this is why we focus on words so greatly. This blurb says you can change plans as your situation changes, but only during specific time periods, such as October 15th to December 7th. Well, it's just not that cut and dried when it can relate to pre-existing conditions, which is why we really caution you to understand exactly how these open enrollment periods can work and how they can greatly affect your plan choices. Okay, so here is a quick recap of some of the highlights between Medigap and Medicare Advantage. 
As you can see here on the left, Medigap allows you to have your choice of physician or hospital anywhere in the country as long as they accept original Medicare. This allows you to travel within the U.S. without having to worry as much about finding in-network care. Budgeting is also easier with a Medigap plan because although the monthly premiums are higher, you don't have as many out-of-pocket expenses, so you have more flat costs throughout the year. Part of the out-of-pocket costs that is really important to note is that there are lower medical costs should you need more treatment. If you have cancer, if you have heart attacks, or more severe needs, your out-of-pocket costs are not going to increase with a Medigap plan. These plans also provide flexibility, whether it is traveling or it is picking a drug plan that goes uniquely with your Medigap plan. Now, the one thing with Medigap plans is you do have to acknowledge that they are higher premium and you have to be okay with that if you choose Medigap coverage. Now on the right hand side, let's talk about Medicare Advantage, which again, we do recommend these all the time for anyone that cannot afford Medigap premiums. This is by far better than having nothing when it comes to original Medicare. These are also great options for anyone under 65 that may have social security disability, because if this applies to you, you'll find that Medigap premiums are often much higher than they are for people 65 or older. If you get most of your medical care through the VA system, Medicare Advantage plans can be a great low-cost option should you seek care outside of that system. Also, some people are just fine with networks and they don't mind having the restrictions of having to find in-network facilities where they accept your Medicare Advantage plan. Others may even think, I'm healthy and that's not going to change. We're not here to convince you otherwise, so we can help you find a Medicare Advantage plan that works for you. Lastly, not everyone travels as much during retirement. If that applies to you, you may be okay with a more limited local network that is going to reduce your monthly premiums. I also want to finish this comparison by mentioning again that Medigap plans do not include additional benefits like gym memberships, dental, vision, and hearing coverage, or over-the-counter benefits in their coverage. Whereas on the other hand, Medicare Advantage plans do typically include routine coverage for dental vision hearing as well as potentially a free gym membership and some other additional benefits. Give us a call and we can help you compare any of these options. Now let's talk about prescription drug coverage and how it relates to Medicare Advantage and Medigap. We alluded to this earlier, but if you have original Medicare and Medigap, you should purchase a standalone prescription drug plan, also known as Part D. What this will look like is that you have primary medical insurance through Medicare, secondary insurance through your Medigap plan, and then separate standalone prescription drug coverage that you will use when you need to go to the pharmacy to get your prescriptions filled. Whereas with a Medicare Advantage plan, your prescription drug coverage would be a part of the bundled package that we mentioned earlier that includes your medical coverage. Of course, we can't talk about prescription drug coverage without mentioning the infamous donut hole. We have other videos that go into detailed discussions on this topic, so if you really want to understand how the donut hole works, that is going to be your best bet. For now, just understand that if you do take expensive medications, once you're in the donut hole, it will likely result in higher costs associated with your prescriptions. Once you've gone through deciding that Medicare is right for you, you understand how much it costs, you've now enrolled into Part A and Part B, and you've decided which path to take for your coverage, what happens next? How do you put all those things together? That's where we come in. We can help you do an individual review of coverage options, including both Medigap and Medicare Advantage. We can help you narrow it down to what carrier is best for you and how much that will cost you each month. We enroll you into the best drug plan for your particular medications. We handle all of the paperwork, and we alleviate the stress of your having to call insurance companies directly. This service comes at no additional cost to you as we're compensated by insurance carriers just as your home and auto insurance agent is. In addition to helping you get enrolled into the system for the first time, we're going to continue to be there to assist you in reviewing your plan annually. Typically, the time for this review is during the annual election period known as AEP. This occurs between October 15th and December 7th each year, and your coverage will begin on January 1st of the following year. During this time, you can change from one Medicare Advantage plan to another or change your Part D prescription drug plans. If you have a Medicare Advantage plan and would prefer a Medigap policy, during this time you can also apply for that coverage and make the change if, and I can't stress this enough, if you qualify after undergoing medical underwriting. Lastly, you can also leave a Medigap plan and enroll into Medicare Advantage with little to no underwriting during this time period.
What many people don't understand is the timing related to when they can change Medigap plans. So this example is going to be if you're trying to go from one Medigap plan to another. Yes, you can do that during the annual election period, as we just mentioned. However, what you should also know is you can change every single day of the calendar year. We want to emphasize that because so many people think that they have to wait until the fall to change their Medigap plan when, in reality, they can work on changing plans anytime during the calendar year. So if you get a rate increase in February or March or April, don't think you have to wait until October to make a change. You can start saving money right away. Again, this does come with the caveat that you have to pass underwriting in order to change plans. And on to our resources. Here's where we continue to help you with the Medicare learning process. A great place to start is our YouTube channel. This is full of really detailed content if you have additional Medicare questions. The best part here is that you can watch these clips at your own pace and call us when you have questions. So go ahead and please subscribe to this channel. And we've also built this for you, the Giardini Medicare Vault. It has additional video content and a number of documents stored in there for you as a resource. We also like to point out our Google reviews so that you can see what others are saying about working with us. Lastly, the best way to reach us is to visit our website and schedule a consultation with one of our advisors, or call us directly at 248-871-7756. Thanks for joining us for this Medicare 101 presentation. We look forward to working with you.